Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. The book we're doing this week is Iron Widow by, I have forgotten the author's name already. Do you remember, Maria? It is by Jaron J. Zhao. Okay, and this is going to be the beginning of an interesting tradition in this episode, which is all of us butchering Chinese names. Because Iron Widow uses a lot of Chinese names and the author is Canadian Chinese, I believe. I'm just going to apologize right now for how badly we're going to butcher them. And also, I barely remember any of the names to begin with. But with me are my co-hosts. Maria. And Katie. And so, Maria, do you want to explain briefly the beginning of this book? The beginning of this book is uh, we are situated in a world, a society that's kind of set in the future. It's called uh, the society slash country is called Hua Sha. They are humans at war with these Hundun creatures that are like these insectoid, almost metallic type. Think Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. Yes. And in this society, there are chrysalises where like men and with their like woman concubine people go to fight the evil Hunduns. And chrysalises are basically Mecca. Yeah, they're Mecca. This is the, the tagline for this book is A Handmaid's Tale plus uh, Pacific Rim. And that is... Pretty, pretty accurate. And in the society, women are very much lesser looked down upon. Foot binding is a thing in wealthier families or people who can afford to do it, trying to marry off their daughters. And we are situated in the perspective of this character named Zetian, um, who is raging against the patriarchy machine. She's from a frontier village. Her sister became a concubine pilot and ended up dying not in battle. So another thing is a lot of concubine pilots end up dying. Their male partners end up using too much of them and they kind of become little battery packs for chi. And they end up dying a lot. And her sister didn't even die uh, during a battle. She just got murdered and she's really angry and she wants revenge and that's the start of the book right she decides to become a pilot and kill the pilot who killed her sister so here's the thing i hated this book (laughs) i started out thinking it was kind of not for me it was harmless wish fulfillment and in the week and a half since i finished it i have now transitioned to thinking that it is harmful wish fulfillment katie also hated this book maria i know you just like parts of it Why don't you start Um, us out by saying anything positive about it? So this book is beautifully paced. You, there's never, there was never a moment where I was like, can we please get to like the next point? We've read a lot of lately, like slow books. I had some issues with the pacing in Dune, which was the last book Will and I read. Uh, And then we read Priory of the Orange Tree, which had, ooh, that that was a slow baby. This book has, I'm going to make a lot of similarities between Dune and this book, and it's going to make me look at Dune in better lighting. <laughs> they, <laughs> for the record, so- very quickly for the readers, we'll probably release this before our Dune episode, oh. but th- these are a little bit out of sequence. I, of had, how I had some You just said readers. With- I think you meant listeners. Listeners, yes. Who also hopefully are readers. So it's, it's really well paced. I like the actual, except for the last third, the, for the first two thirds, I like the actual plot. I like the things that happen. I don't necessarily like the way it's presented. Like Will said, there's definitely an wish fulfillment side to it. And some the ways things presented that I think had they been changed, it would have been for me as a reader, much more enjoyable. But I, I like the initial idea of the world. It gets, I will make a complaint about the world building in a moment, but I like the kind of tech. You've got a lot of ancient Chinese civilization things coming in. You've got a lot of futuristic, like Pacific Rim vibes, and I like all of that. And I think it's a great place to couch a story. And again, I like part of what happens in the story, but the last third just there's there's a lot of things. But that's that's what I have to say. And I like some of the side characters. I will say that I liked one side character and that the pacing, yeah, the pacing is good. I noticed that as I was reading it, I was like, okay, things are happening at a good pace. It's just that what's happening is really stupid and the characters, I really wanted to get hit by a train. So here, I'm going to say- Wait, can can I preface something really quick? Hit it. Dear, Dear readers, I have read reviews and I've also read that some people are getting black for not liking this book. I read a review that was kind of sad because she said a bunch of her friends who had expressed dislike for this book were getting some harassment. And no, our opinions are subjective. I very much like the writer's videos that I've seen on YouTube. I've watched a lot of them. So I don't like 
I like her as a creator. I just don't love this piece of fiction from her. And you are free to like. No, here's what's up. I'm right <laughs> about this. I reject that view entirely. There is objective good and bad. And this is a bad book. The author is very likable in her in her YouTube videos. She's known for, uh, she popped up on YouTube and is known for doing videos critiquing Chinese culture and media. So like uh, the, the one she's best known for is uh, the new Mulan movie she criticizes. And you know, she is kind of likable. She has like, uh, she's sort of funny and stuff, but I should really just explain. The biggest problem with this book is that Zetian, despite growing up in a- Or Zetian, in the, in the audiobook, it was often pronounced Jatin instead of a Z E. She's the only name I remember, and apparently I'm gonna butcher it, so I'm just gonna call her. She is, despite growing up in a super patriarchal, oppressive society, and with a super patriarchal, oppressive family who's also abusive and broke her feet at a young age, she is super, super feminist all the time, and there's never any real explanation for how she developed this viewpoint. And she just yells it at everyone all the time. This book is sim morally incredibly simplistic. Good characters are super feminist all the time. There's no real conflict for them. They were born that way. All the bad characters are super patriarchal. And it's okay if you do horrible things to them because they're super patriarchal and terrible. Yeah, that was the another thing. I <laughs> So like by the time she was meeting... At some point towards the beginning, she goes through the introduction of, you know, who she is, who she knows, her family. Then she goes into being a, a concubine or in her case, a consort pilot. And then she does what she does. I don't know if we're including spoilers, but she... Yeah, always. Oh, okay. Uh, well, she kills her pilot, who she always intended to kill because this was the pilot that killed her sister. So anyway, she kills him, though not in the way she intended. It's less of a murder and more of a survival thing. And when she comes out out victorious there are these two strategy advisors or whatever sh that are questioning her and she or not questioning her engaging with her and she somehow comes up with all this like tactical knowledge that she like or battle str strategy that she's aware will happen and it's like when the next attack will happen which granted could be explained and how certain politics were gonna happen and i'm like how does this peasant girl who doesn't have regular access to like google essentially their google or whatever search engine they have and is this only gonna be explained away her knowledge for it by her rich boyfriend pseudo boyfriend who comes by like once a week and lets her use his month, like essential once a, month. once a month excuse me and lets her search on his like essential like database tablet, or phone yeah. or tablet okay thank you and let's her search which again uh i would love to come back to this if i can remember but the technology and the discussion of its use combined with the culture of this place I, she does not mix it well but anyway going back to what i was saying how is she gonna know so much news and political information and like just like just what goes on kind of between the pilots and stuff if she barely has access to educational or academic information at all so context for the readers women are not allowed access to tablets unless every once in a while to view specific things they're allowed to watch but otherwise they are kept away from any of that stuff um and connecting like katie's point of why does she know all this battle stuff and will's point how is she a woke feminist Generally, there's an inciting instance to create really big mind shift from the general. There's a reason a lot of people in the past who eventually were like, yeah, no, that was wrong, didn't initially think things were wrong. It's because this was just the norm. It's indoctrination. It just happened. So it's different from like Handmaid's, The Handmaid's Tale, where she knew better, her society had been different, and now they're in a fucked up society and she's raging against the machine. But even then, I would say she does it within the system and like she's still like there she only well, has she's a part power. of her world not like this girl who just is like speech speech feminism feminism <laughs> this this girl literally feels like she was dropped into this world from ours but she's not just like from ours but like she was rallying in the streets like and and so there's just this disconnect of how did she end up this way um, and I think part of that is that the society seems to be designed to be like the most patriarchal 
terrible society so that you the, as a reader I think initially it's like well of course you would think that's wrong and and perhaps I'm looking it because I do think this is wish fulfillment now Will's argument whether it's harmful or not we'll get to but there is this wish fulfillment side to it but even then perhaps I am asking for too much realism that to have an inciting like how does she become knowledgeable how does she know all of the because she spouts like a lot of feminist like and she just like it just comes out or like foot binding is wrong and like and, and granted yes absolutely painful but it was a value system back then I'd say back then in the, in the society that she is now it, again in, in China when they were doing foot part binding. of what Maria is saying too is that so or not what I'm saying about what Maria is saying is that a lot of times when there is a you know a feminist character in a medieval world, because that did happen in real life, it's because they're part of a movement or a social trend or part of the counterculture or something like that. People just, and that's, that's again why this book is actually kind of harmful, is that people are not born with the right views. We are all born to the society we are in and we have to work to confront those views and uh, de-indoctrinate de and detoxify herself. That is never the case here. And in terms of what Maria is saying about, it, it makes her feel like an inorganic part of the world. And so everything she says is preaching because it's not coming from her. She does not come from this world. It took me out of it. You know, like as a reader, it just immediately, because my first question was, how did she learn? I was like, going to say, that's a really valuable way of getting the reader to empathize with her is to see her go through that journey of oppressed to, to waking up. And the other thing I noticed about this book is in terms of her sister, you guys know in my own writing, I have an extremely bad habit of starting closer to the middle of a story than I should. In this case, this book should not start where it is because her sister is not a character. Her sister's suffering simply exists to motivate her. It's a, She's essentially fridged. And also, it happens off screen. This is like if in Star Wars, Luke's farm got burned up before the movie started. No, you need to be able to be there with the character to feel these things. Her sister also is never fleshed out later as a character. She is never, she doesn't remember her sister fondly. She just remembers, like twice her sister says something in her memory. There's no sense of real trauma or loss there, which there should be and would actually help you like the character more. My whole thing that could have really easily sort of aided this was getting rid of the prologue from the prince or the, you know, the prince level perspective, um, which was- and, the, and it's literally the guy who murdered her sister. It's that guy. Why include his perspective? Why wouldn't the prologue have been her sister's, sister's perspective, perspective in that situation and her or suffering? the moment he killed her sister. Yeah, and then why wouldn't the next part actually be not not getting her fucking eyebrows tweezed? But why wouldn't it be her, like, next to her sister's ashes, giving them to the water like she says she did? Or why wouldn't it be a flashback even? And then like compare that to the pre anything that would have shown the connection between her and her sister. And then I also wanted to note, like you were saying before, it would have been far more fascinating for her to already be indoctrinated, but very hateful and angry internally, like super spiteful, super spiteful. Like what's her face? from memoirs of a geisha spiteful and then she slowly but surely blooms outwardly also like when she says welcome to your nightmare we'll, we'll get there we'll get there we're still just in the <laughs> okay this book made me think a lot of a song of ice and fire and the show version like is what people are aware of and it handles all these themes terribly but it actually and we'll talk more about why later but this book really reminded me of it and cersei as a character in that in a song of ice and fire and game of thrones is actually kind of a more feminist character in certain ways and that her raw rage at the patriarchy feels much more real and much more earned to me than this kind of immediate woke feminism of you know i already know all about this she does zetian does go through a little bit of an arc but it's really perfunctory in terms of not blaming other women as much but then she does something towards the end that makes you wait go like wait did she even learn anything the biggest aspect and again we'll this we should get to this later of her growth is more like her relationship with another male character but again if i had said to will the story potentially could have worked better if she was part of like if she didn't grow up in the frontiers if she was part like if she grew up in the actual city but surrounded by more women that she could create relationships and see that like this woman is smarter than this guy this woman it happens to be really like she's surprisingly str just like and and have moments that she like she pulls it and again 
having a relationship with her sister. The most we learned about her sister was that her sister behaved like a girl normally should. And now she's dead. And she's, we're told she's sad. And like, we get these moments of grief, but her grief over Lee Shermin is much more palpable because we get memories we get flashbacks and we never get a scene i was so hoping that there would be some scenes some flashbacks maybe some dreams of her with good moments with her sister and the most is her remembering her sister telling her like calm down they're your family and that's the it. thing about it and you're totally right is that the author treats other female characters as props there are basically no really fleshed out female characters besides Zetian. There's like two other characters that are a little bit are there, but mostly women's grief is used as a prop for Zetian to then rage at the patriarchy. The yeah, Her sister it's... is fridged. And usually that's a term that has a specific connotation of uh, being for a male character. But what I mean is that her sister is an object for her to, you know, it's funny because um, the author, I watched her video complaining about Shadow and Bone. And one of the things she said is that it was unfair for them to change two characters race to Asian because they only did it sort of as suffering porn. And that was mean to, or that was not a nice thing to do to Asians who would have to relive that trauma, essentially just as scenery. This actually feels a lot like that to me in terms of the female characters, because they're not here. Ooh, shots, shots, Will. And again, I just think the way, like I said, I don't have an issue, because uh, I love me a, like, I, I like characters that I don't necessarily agree with or who I don't necessarily see myself in that do things that I wouldn't do like uh, it's fiction I like going into it that way but she just I don't get why she is the way she is and and that just makes it really hard to be like okay this th this girl is gonna do some morally gray shit because of all of this and all we get is this society that feels again it feels like it's made to be the worst possible and not the worst possible thing for women, but pretty bad. Like, you, it doesn't feel at all. It also doesn't, by the way, feel organic to the more tech part of that world. This is not 1984 where everybody is super controlled. There should be movements on the internet of feminism because they have an open internet system. Like, there's no real reason for this level of oppressive patriarchy to take place. So it just feels sort of like suffering porn. Well, there's also no explanation behind that. Like, exactly who can access it? Who can't? Why? When? Are women all just breeding machines? It doesn't really seem that way. It kind of feels like, because the fact that we have wives and husbands that are vaguely like in a normal relationship, peasants lot wise, like her mother and father, like, why can't, like, is it because they're not rich enough? And those women who are rich enough and do have the enough money, money must have some type of value in this world, even though it's not really discussed. Like, so all of that's just not fully fleshed out. Also, I thought, wouldn't it have been wonderful if she had been, you know, that bitter internal voice of like anger. And then when she synced, I guess, with, I forget his name, but the first dude that killed her sister, when she synced with him, I really understood and felt that dissonance that she explains where she doesn't understand reality from what it was like to sync with this really large, like mechanical creatures and like, all this stuff and be in this uh, nether realm of her mental and his mental like mix. And it would have, it made so much sense. The like rabid violence that came afterwards uh, and how they could, she could have played into like the insanity of her truly her mind breaking and not really understanding. And maybe that's why it works so well. It's because she can't uh, adjust to either place totally. And there could have been so much cool shit that came from that, but no, like she just, so I, I want to say a, a last thing about her character specifically for now and then transition maybe to talk about some of the other characters before we like expand on the plot. She just, this cycle happens where someone says something sexist to her, she comes back with feminist quip and then they say something sexist again and then there will be moments where she'll like question herself and then she'll be like, no, I, what I thought before was right. And so like, it just happens over and over and there's only one thing that like there's only one thing one situation does she actually regret or go back on what she thought and it is localized to one specific character and her interactions with him not her worldview like when you have extremist characters and she absolutely is and perhaps this is something that gets explored in the second book but due to the tone and the way this book is presented i'm a little skeptical to have those extremist characters have a moment where they're like okay okay 
let's reassess. And it doesn't happen. And it, except, like I said, in this one very specific situation, one, one specific character, which has nothing to do with her general world. Okay, and any movement she has as a character is so incredibly perfunctory. I mean, there's this scene where her and... Um, the bad boy pilot later on they're getting publicity photos she mean? yeah they're getting publicity photos taken of them and they're both posed in ways that aren't authentic to them so he's posed as like a bad boy and she's posed as like dangerous but sexy and so in a paragraph she looks at the pictures goes oh this isn't like this is kind of bothering me that you know we're being portrayed this way and then by the end of the paragraph she's okay with it because it's not really them it happens in a paragraph that could be an entire novel's worth of growth of thinking like okay what is authentically me what is not authentically me i don't really like the hunger games but at least they kind of engaged with that she does it in like in three minutes. It's an incredibly blunt and simplistic book. And before, less than and I just, three minutes. Less than three minutes. I have to go back to what Katie said really quick. I thought that the melding in the mind melding in this book, the Pacific Rim, the two pilots working together, that was so incredibly underwhelming. There are yes, so it was. Many ways oh my God. That that could have been written better. And also so many ways that that could have been horrific because it is yes. horrific to meld your brain with somebody else. There's a and with an alien creature. There's a movie I can't remember the name of. Basically, it's about like an assassin who takes over people's minds oh oh go. what was that called shoot i don't remember that. but the visuals of it are super trippy because it actually shows their faces melding in a weird john carpenter kind of way that could have been this book these these women are being polyped onto men who have control over them and instead it's just like this vague dream world it's called possessor possessor yeah it, there could have been so much more done with that as a way of exploring the themes of the book and the body horror of it, and it's not. And uh, related to that, but not exactly the same, I thought the action scenes in this book were actually pretty poor. They're unclear, they're not tense, they're not engaging. The amount of time she has to explain what elements do what means that she should not have used that elemental system. It's way too complicated. If you have to explain it every single time it comes up, it's not good. It seems very, like, not essential either. I mean, it is, but without actually actively coming into play in an act you take that out of the book it does not matter it does not change anything it does not matter at all yeah no this is not like avatar the last airbender like it's kind of like a cool easter egg that maybe she should have included in that way i also thought the wind winds or whatever they're called were really boring yeah i know what were they even yeah that like that doesn't make any sense either in my opinion considering one the ending although i'm unsure of how the next book works and two like and and to give perspective to that that basically what comes out at the end of the book is that the Hunduans were originally the they're the they're the native people they're the and the humans came in from space they're the colonizers and they're just killing them and so the Hunduans have only been acting in self-preservation to protect themselves to protect their like Nausicaa in the valley of the wind there's this huge like cultural lie that has been sold to them the idea that there has been an, a civilization an ancient civilization that had been there for centuries and I like the idea again I, I don't I'm not angry at the stuff that happens except for the last third which we'll get to in this book I'm just angry with how it's presented because like you get dropped this piece of information. So as Katie said so quickly and just so randomly, but again, I like the idea of this whole cultural lie, this, uh, this illusion of that you think it's post-apocalyptic and then you realize that it's colonization. Exactly. And I, I like that. I like, and again, I like the idea of a, a girl who's being like, you killed my sister. I'm a murder this pilot. I love this premise. Remember, I was the one who, when I was researching books for this, I sent it to you and I was like, we got to do this book. This sounds awesome. And it just, so going to some other characters, because I'd like to eventually address the last third. And I, you could let, you could let Katie and Will rage about this book. <laughs> <laughs> for probably three hours and uh they'd still be going so i'm, I'm a ringleader this i want to talk about the the side characters like will pointed out besides for two other female characters who have so i lied there's her mother and grandmother who have tiny roles in the beginning pop up in the middle and then pop up at the end and i just want to make a small comment Man, what a wasted opportunity to show character growth between her mother and her grandmother and her. Because her mother already shows signs of knowing something's wrong with the way things work while still being heavily indoctrinated into the culture. Like, actually portrayed that way. What a wasted effort in, uh, or a wasted opportunity to show character growth in her grandmother, her mother, and her 
and how like it could have created a domino effect through her ability to become the iron widow and her grand- there's so many fascinating female relationship stories that could be told in this book there's could be the fact that she like maybe some of the memories of the old widow pilot stay in the machine in the chrysalis and she engages with those could have been stuff with her mother and her grandmother as katie said it's so frustrating but but yeah like isn't it totally a wasted like it's amount such of a waste. potential i really thought that as well also i would like to point out that so if anybody has not read this and understood this there it's a threesome sort of thing it's a poly story between her a pretty boy from her childhood or not childhood but her young adulthood and who like genuinely is gently loving her who is perfect from the beginning he's a perfect feminist yeah he Perfect. He never changes. He never no. really changes. He's he literally like a like total white knight. And then From the you beginning. have, and then you have the like guts or guts, uh, like berserk, super intense character. I, I should explain. Uh, the Shimon is the the kind of bad boy one. He's a, a pilot who's like from the vaguely step nomad Mongol. People. Mongol. I'm not sure if it's Mongol because I don't want to be offensive, but that's how I thought of it in my head as well. Um, and like he basically is he like he murdered some he murdered his family, but he has such high spiritual power that they have to use him and they keep him bleach. In a- that's all I could think of was bleach with that spirit power stuff or spirit pressure. And like she goes in thinking like, oh, he maybe he's dangerous, and then it ends up that you no, know, he's a super sweet, super nice guy who's just been forced into the situation. He is the character who I felt had the most. I had the most interest in because there's a little Me bit going too. on there. I thought he was defanged way too fast. And I also, Oh my thought, God. I yes. thought he was also kind of, it's disingenuous to go like this character would not be carrying more trauma. It's this thing where like abuse victims have to be like really nice and like there should be more ugliness to his character because of the things he's had to live through. Absolutely. Like he could have started as that sweet guy. Right. And then he's and then there's like a when she meets him in the drift or whatever into the chrysalis, there's like, oh, he seems like there's such danger there and it doesn't make sense with like there's such anger there. And then like later it's evaporated and he's a super nice guy who wears glasses in reality and it almost feels like emotionally she can't handle the characters not doing being treated as great all the time for more than like three minutes and she just immediately has to loop them back to oh no they're great people oh also he's a perfect feminist by the way and the reason he killed his family was for feminist reasons again there's this weird like (sighs) go ahead and take us somewhere else maria Okay. They were explaining uh, Lee Sherman's character, who I have a lot of the same issues with. Big, dark, bad boy with the heart of gold. Very much anime concept. Very much like, like if you're a teen girl and you like certain archetypes, we got one of each for you. Because we also have like the smart, pretty boy, rich boy, Yeejer. His character makes the least amount of sense. Because he's like initially just really sweet. They meet to like, he's, he's a city boy. He, at once a month, he comes into, they met on complete accident. She was out picking herbs and she wandered in on him, like relaxing in the woods. And ever since then, they've been seeing each other like once a month for three years. He teaches her how to read because women don't normally get to read the script. Uh, And he seems just initially like this really sweet, good boy. But then you get like this idea that his, his family has this really like dark fucked up side to the point where he's covered in tattoos that his dad made him get but you never really see what dark like how that darkness has actually affected him he's just like a sweet good and like I like what his character does but he's presented as a sweet good boy with like dark potential ugliness underneath like the opposite of Lee Sherman but we never see that like what is he does one thing at okay the end. here's the thing it's so bizarre that she chose this is a supposedly a feminist book and the two characters with the most exploration and the most growth besides the main character are dudes it's which weird is, that this is, is the choice she, no that, no no that, it's not fine how you how you present it and if there was other like it just like the idea that a feminist story has to be like it has to do this thing it has to do this thing it has to do this thing i don't like that but the problem I do. is he does not. He's, he's being facetious. Please. I just, I need, I need the list. I, I understand. Like, it's the whole um, Bechdel test. It's a Bechdel test is a good test of G media in general. It's not necessarily a good test of whether a book itself is feminist or not. I am saying in that in the case of this book, 
it's super weird that she decides to spend all of her time talking about male characters and their man pain in a patriarchal system instead of the women in it who are treated like objects. And I was thinking about this as the book was going, but like, the ladies never really, the one conversation she, like, the one pleasant conversation she has with a woman, uh, it's another female pilot, like, they talk about, so the, actually they talk about another woman. So yes, there is a scene where the Bechdel test is passed, but a lot of the conversations between the other women are about their respected pilots. And again, it's not like there are, like, that doesn't, that's not, the, I'm not saying this always happens, there are times where that doesn't happen but it just that is something that i find an issue. it's indicative in this story um but back to the, the characters uh because you have those two the big issue for me with those three is they become a poly and i am totally not a i loved the idea of a polyamorous like romance which is what happens but it happens so quickly <laughs> like like, I want a slow burn, especially from two male characters that, as far as now, Yeejir might have had, like, it's it's never, we never find out if he has ever done anything with a guy before. There's, like, this implication. And Zechen uh, has a moment where she's like, you know, I've always been a little curious that maybe he, he swings both ways. And so, like, him, I believe, she has that moment. So you think, like, okay, maybe he, as a city guy who has, like, lived, like, a, a, a wealthy lifestyle, maybe he... He has explored that side of himself. But let me tell you, I do not for a minute believe the um, half Rondi character who is like, because he's he's not. Uh, yeah, it's like a marginalized Mongol-ish step nomad. And he's, he's half and they're considered like really violent and they're looked down upon. And so he has always dealt with that. And this character whose life has been just real shit and spent a huge part of it recently in prison by himself and only ever dealing with like guards or women has had any like exploration into his sexuality generally the people that have the least exploration into any sort of sexuality are those who are going through a lot of trauma <laughs> that, that's a generalization but it, it happens and it just like i don't believe that that guy in one book and literally like four scenes with this other character would kiss him. The amount of homophobia in their society is really unexplored and it's really hard to grasp because then at one point she mentions like, okay, and then the three of us had sex. Who cares what society thinks? We're super rebel and cool. We live just among ourselves. A triangle is the strongest shape. It, no, she says earlier in the book that it's something that society is really against, but she's never understood why. And she thinks, you know, she's she's had moments where she's been like, dang, that's an attractive lady. But the thing is, again, I connect back to the inciting incident. My mother, I both of my moms are lesbians, and my one mom ha really admired her female gym teacher. And only as an adult woman who had come to terms with her sexuality can look back at that admiration and be like, yeah, no, I, I totally, I had a crush. I had a crush on, I thought I, I miss, I was young. I didn't know any better. I miss, uh, attributed my crush to admiration. And that's something that I also, of course, it could have been an experience like mine where you don't really care one way or the other. And you've gone through so much trauma that you haven't truly been able to experience your sexuality. So then as you get older and you encounter someone who actually gives you tenderness and gives you love and gives you understanding, you're like, I don't care what gender that person is. I just want to be with someone who gives me something like that. It's because I haven't had that. And so then you're like, yeah, okay, so screw sexual or screw gender. I don't care what I am. I just want to be with or that person. Or it could be like my experience where like you get drunk one night and there's like three guys around. I just wanted to be part of it and say I had an experience. <laughs> but anyway, my point is, there's, <laughs> she very casually just is like, and yeah, I have attraction to women. Where in again in that society, in like given her life, I I just it doesn't it doesn't compute. It, it's like one plus one equals ninety, and you're like what? It, and it feels like she's like a, a regular girl from our society in our generation, and who has this like self awareness that just feels like way too high. And and so I didn't I, I I and I just thought that was like a really like it's another example of the book just being like okay we don't really care about this world. It's mostly just here for like oppression porn. Yeah stop saying that word because i don't think youtube likes it but whatever we should need to talk about the ending because that's going to
going to take us a bit. Did you want to cover anything else before that, though, Maria? Uh, so there are other side characters. There are female side characters that, like, there's one character who ends up having, like, a not growth. We just learn more about her. And initially, she's, like, real, like, she seems like the bad other female pilot. And then there's, like, the good other female pilot. And by the end, they've swapped places. And... It just felt... It, they haven't even s- swapped places. They've swapped places, and then Jitian murders the pilot who was trying to... So, okay. Wait, wait. Before we get to this, there's one thing. Zetian's entire motivation has just been to make the world better for girls. And not even, like, at, initially it's just revenge for her sister, then something's wrong with the pilot system. I think it's unfairly targeting women. This, this needs to be brought out to the people. We need to stop this. So, again, this all feels like, okay, I see where this is going. And and she carries that. Now, she does do some... The, the main trio does a very problematic thing because you're about to jump into like the super problematic thing and completely miss step one step one is they murder a guy they torture him to death they Um, waterboard him specifically with alcohol they alcohol board him now right which is supposed to be ironic because he was making le chimine uh, a drunkard on per- like alcoholic on purpose but especially because he should be dead yes that's true he, he only has like ha- one one kidney half a liver like that man cannot drink that much alcohol okay anyway. let me lay out let me lay out the situation so basically jetien and uh i, I can't pronounce it you, a little bit like he, you you're fret like it. so she and le chimine both think that there's something going on with the pilot program it can't be that women have lower chi naturally so the general who is like not a good dude right he's a bad dude he's a strat He's a strategist. They kidnap him, waterboard him with alcohol, and then tell him that his son, they've killed his son. And then once they've gotten the information they want, they murder him. I, there is so much wrong with this. It, as I told Maria at the time, it is the apotheosis of this book's view that if you are a good person, you are born a good person, and what you do is righteous. And if you are you are born a bad person, then what you do is bad, and you are not really a person. And it also needs to be said, it's not just that they torture him and torture him to death, which is bad. And specifically waterboarding, which has very specific connotations in today's society. It is also that the torture is effective in getting the information they want. I was recently watching, uh, re-watching an episode of The Next Generation where the captain gets tortured, right? And one of the things he mentions in it is that torture has never been a reliable means of intelligence gathering. And that is true. That is one of the big problems with torture is that people say it's effective. It's not. Jack Bauer, th- that's a myth. And to so in this book, for it to be portrayed as effective is super not okay. And I could keep ranting, but I'm, I'm gonna let one of you guys talk. The problem is, it's she briefly, like afterwards, is like, you know, because uh, Lee Shamin and her do this thing, and he gets like real dark. And it's the one moment where you see him get real dark because they basically find out that in the pilot system, they create the woman's seat to be more passive and to be like t- more of their chi gets depleted than the, the guys see. And that's why these women, even if they have equal power, even if they're actually stronger, die so much more. And they do it to keep, like, why would men join the army if they know they're super likely to die? And granted, this is all terrible. Like, and this character, he's not a good character. Like, he's not a nice guy. Uh, but there's a lack of nuance to him and then to them afterwards. Like, when they show the video of what they've done, to including them murdering this man to um Yija. yeah to him he is immediately like oh we gotta get them but there's no moment of them contemplating like them doing this horrific act and it's for her like the second time she's ever actively killed someone and this time actually like in because the first time it happens it happens in a mind realm in the chrysalis she doesn't even realize and she's survival. killed him no it's survival yeah she doesn't even realize she's killed him in that moment it's only until afterwards where she wakes up and it's a lifeless body that she fully realizes it and there's no backlash because again i am down for characters doing like crazy not good it is not framed as a gray moment it is framed th- nothing in this book is framed as as gray or Problem anything other than that she fully does awesome that she does right and the other thing is the reason this is another parallel to song of ice and fire is that in that book the author is always very careful that violence has a cost it blows back on your emotional health and yeah. it's not sad and revenge is not a fantasy to be indulged in it is a di- f- violence is hard and it 
it hurts you as much as it hurts them, even if you have to do it. So literally, I think the next scene, the three of them like make out and have a threesome. Is, is that when they hook yes, up? Yes, after he sees the video, something happens and it causes the like thing. And they're like, we're going to we're going to do this. And it just like, oof, like I want some blowback. So the torture scene happens and that's really bad. And then in the final scene or in the final sequence of the book, she goes um, full fire and blood. It's a dark Danny moment. It's it's such a Grand Theft Dragon moment that it's really <laughs> dumb. She basically, she gains control of this legendary chrysalis that was the emperor back like 200 years ago or something. And so she goes and she kills all of the strategists she kills a bunch of civilians by going to the Capitol and like burning down buildings. And then she kind of kills her. She maybe kills her parents no, she, because she kills them. She No, she for sure killed her whole family. Oh, no. Right, Because no. they were like, don't kill our son. You can kill us. And she was like, oh, my God, they, they never protected me. And yet they love their son so much. I need to free myself of my emotional attachment to them. And it would be it would be better to them, you know, to be used constantly as a tool to control her would be such a lack. She was used as a tool by them she knows how it feels so it, it, it's a kind it was so fucked it harder. was so fucked and to put some context you have the final battle that they're building up to they're gonna go get the joe province back the the zoids roll out you know <laughs> um, and they're going they're fighting and like this is where you start getting that like the hundons are like they're because they're like leave us alone scourge of the universe please go away and during this scene one of the other chrysalises starts attacking their chrysalis and it results in Li Shimin dying he ejects her and Yijia out of the out of the chrysalis and they fly off with her spirit armor and they just like he gets he gets killed and um she's like what do i do she goes to the white tiger the white tiger can't really like help it, but then she realizes when she's in the white tiger which is piloted by another matched pair uh husband or like husband and wife i don't know she cures his flower pox and she convinces him to sit in the women's seat because he's so powerful. He's super fucking powerful. He was like, now nah, you get into that seat. I am going to drain you in like five minutes. And she's like, yeah, no, he fucking could. This man's a monster. And she was like, you sit in the woman's seat. You be the battery. I'm going to take lead. He's some, for some reason, okay with this, by the way. It, like he gets treated like it's a little weird he goes along with all of her grand theft dragons and, and the author tries to rationalize it where like she says you know you've been gone for 200 years and the world's crazy now and he's like okay that's that's put things in perspective i'll go sit in the woman's seat yeah that doesn't like <laughs> it doesn't but anyway so they go and they sit in the woman's seat and like and they they fly off they kill the hundwins she literally so and here's the moment because you have this female character that is the chrysalis that killed Li Shamin was piloted by the nice female pilot who helped her who offered her makeup in case Li Shamin was beating her and she needed to cover up some bruises how nice uh, that was the scene that they had together and she's the one that like kills Lee Shermin so she goes to them and she's like why did you do this and the pilot's like listen they have my kids they were going to murder my kids if I didn't do this also they have your family you should probably consider what you're doing and also this lady is the one who convinced her to bring her family to the city and have convinced a form of reconciliation and Zechen immediately is like oh you did that so that they could control me and like again potentially yeah but if her kids are constantly being threatened and she loves them you see a scene earlier and it's just established this woman's a mama she loves her kids no nuance into the situation no thinking like she rips their chrysalis apart one claw crushes the tortoise turtle like chrysalis insta dead and then just starts going on a ramp and then in this moment so I I mentioned previously that at no point like her entire goal has just been to make things better for women and all of a sudden out of nowhere the emperor is like what are what are you doing and she was like listen we're uh celebrities we're not actual rulers anymore if you want to rule stick with me and i was like if you want to rule what are you talking she's decided she's empress now that's her goal <laughs> and that's what we're fighting for and i'm like where did this st again it felt like dark danny we're like yeah maybe we could have gone here in a couple of books with like some other things happening if you had actually like leave but it's such a quick sudden snap and it just sucks and and then it's framed as good that she stages a bloody coup 
and Super installs bloody. herself as a dictator. This again, this book I has know. no sense of like maybe this is not a great idea. And like, pretty boy's father comes and is like, "Hey, look, I'm not a good dude, but like, I can help you out, figure things out, and like, you need me, you need even me. trade. I won't show your nudes, and and I'll and you can let me live and like help do your bidding. Right, we can figure. You know, we you're gonna need help. And she's like, "Nah." And pretty boy murders his father out of nowhere. And that's the problem with one of the the big problems. It's not just that she murders it; is that she destroys all of the the institutions and governments. I'm assuming they're not democratically elected, but we're never actually told that uh, they so are. So you right? are. At the very end, you realize, um, and this is something that we haven't mentioned at all, there are gods that exist in the sky that never interact, but every once in a while, you know, maybe you see the, the comet ship thing go by, and at the end of the book, she gets a message from the gods telling her, if you listen to us like the sages did, so the sages were the people who previously ruled this world. Like, and she's killed them. They're, they're gone. Goodbye, sages. Who, like, you're dead. If you listen to us like the sages did, we will, and they show you, like, they don't sh show you, but it's narrated to you that Leisha means lungs, heart, shoulders, and head are in a tank with, like, tubes, and they can bring him back to life. Next book, she's got to decide what to do. I have no faith that the author is able, and again, this is another parallel to A Song of Ice and Fire, because this is the same thing that Danny does in Marine, is that she burns down the establishment and then realize, not in the show, because the show is terrible, she realizes ruling is really difficult. You can't, once you destroy a power structure, no matter how bad or corrupt it is, okay, a new power structure- Okay, they address that in the show. Yeah, they don't they do, do it address well. that. They don't, they do it in I like, don't care. Okay, guys, this, this argument has nothing to do okay. with- Okay, anyway, I don't trust the author to realize that, you know, ruling is difficult and there are compromises the character is going to have to make for the good of everyone and even like women, even though that's those are the only people she really values. I don't trust the author to do that in the sequel because there is no acknowledgement in this book that she took it too far or maybe she should have left some of their institutions in place. I have one thing that makes me think that she eventually will, is that this particular empress that she's basing her on is a really complex actual, like as a figure, did a lot of stuff that was, you know, questionable to get to her point. Now granted, she uses like wit, political stuff to get from like position of concubine to empress. Which I would have liked. Yeah, and I, again, that's fine. I, I, and again, if you play it more like a Cersei, if Cersei not after citadel burning because this moment is citadel burning like for like and with no consequences apparently and again we don't know if there will be consequences afterwards it's a sept not a, a citadel but sept. anyway and so my thing is because that it's entirely through her point of view we might get moment like she as a narrator because it's first person it's so close like, you're so close to her the time so whole time there's no moment where it steps away from her um and this is where i'm going to make some comparisons with dune because dune did something real similar where you had this character who had this like these goals and then all of a sudden is like i shall be emperor when something happened and now granted there were other characters looking at this going in specific his mother going no, what no 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 what are you doing you're going down a wrong and because you get other characters perspectives you realize that this character is going down a dark path you as a reader are like oh paul's making because and also because you know there's a jihad coming and that he's been trying to avoid the whole book paul thinks he's fine <laughs> but you as a reader are like oh no paul you've done or at least paul has kind of accepted that he accepted, is yeah. like this dark figure Th that does not happen here <laughs> that's my point is that like in that book you have some distance from the characters and also paul knows what the future is and so he he had previously noted that this was not a great thing to lead towards so the book itself but because you're so close to her and everything is from her her narration her point of view there is a chance that like she's gonna back away and realize because i do think i have a hope that the author knows that this is fucked up and is going to deal with this or come like it's gonna come to terms and she made a purposefully gray character who doesn't see herself as gray and that's something we're going to have to reckon with will might be right I hope I'm right oh, I because am. I think I, I think you're right, Maria. I think she's doing that, and I only say that because of two dialogue pieces, and I hope she's good enough that that's why she included them, or not dialogue pieces, but like internal dialogue pieces where she reasons with herself, and one of them is when she kills her parents. If she turns her heart to stone 
at first, which granted still should have been, you know, all the things we already said, but if her heart turned to stone and then it learns to open again and look, if she gets better writing in the second book or something, good for her. All right. All right. Okay. I should restate my position here. I don't necessarily think that the author is not going to acknowledge that anything she did is unproblematic. I think the author probably will say like, oh, maybe I went a little too far. I think, though, that if she does decide that, it's going to be in about three seconds flat and she's going to change it within a paragraph. Just, you know, realizing this and realizing, hey, I, I messed up a little bit, but aren't I still great? And the patriarchy still sucks. And I say that because that is what consistently happens in this book. Again, we go back to them getting pictures, publicity pictures taken of them. In three minutes, she she goes and is like, okay, this is fine. Or earlier when she semi, like, not forgives her family, but like softens on them a little bit, that happens in two paragraphs. And the other problem is that when you're judging a book like this, it's very Im- immaterial, not immaterial. Uh, it- it's hard to define, but books have a tenor and a atmosphere to them. So The Bear and the Nightingale, one of the things I talked about really liking in that book was that it felt very real. So when characters did bad things and it wasn't mentioned by the narrative, it was like, okay, this is the real world though, we understand. If you are setting up your characters to be gray and do problematic things, you need to set that up even a little bit in the first book. Like, like writing has narrative rules and tools to tell your audience things. And she uh, she uses none of those to say, hey, maybe what Zetian is doing here is actually really kind of not great. She uses none of those. No, I agree fully. That's why I didn't read the whole book. That's why I asked Maria to summarize it for me and I skimmed the rest. I have never done that other than maybe with another school book a long time ago. I've never done that to a book. I've never not given it a chance as much as that. But one with our like, you know, with our deadline, but also two, I just like by by the end of the prologue, I was very doubtful. And then by the end of the like seventh chapter, I was like, mm. it's so frustrating. Again, I love feminist literature. I really enjoy Handmaid's Tale. Ursula K. Le- well, yeah. What's your background in? Why don't you tell our listeners what your background is? I have a master's in literature. I studied Japanese women writers and their relationship with their society and history. I've done a lot of work into like, like I've taken all the like feminist theory courses. I did feminist digital humanities, the whole nine yards. I'm a woman. Oh. I was raised by like two very independent lesbians. I have a mom and Um, three sisters and so it just it's not that i'm like ooh, too much feminism it's just the way it's presented like handmaid's tale love a lot of ursula k le guin's stories and like the way she presents like and even when her characters are mainly male like the female characters are presented the way like the dispossessed is one of my favorite books ever and i wouldn't necessarily say it's a feminist piece of literature but i find that it's much more nuanced (laughs) that's the thing it's just there's no nuance that's the problem. Congratulations, guys. No, here's my final. Here's my final explanation. Okay, so the thing is, and the reason that I think this is harmful wish fulfillment is because it hammers home again and again that good people are born that way and everything they do is good. And the yeah, reason I that is problematic is because if I do something sexist, right? And I go, okay, hold on. Was that sexist? And all my ideas of what sexism is, is cackling evil villains. Then I go, oh no, I'm not a evil cackling villain. What I did must not be sexist. Exactly. No, it's correct. It's counterproductive to facilitate that worldview. It's counterproductive to trying to take down the patriarchy. And it's it's counterproductive to raise women up. This book uses women for oppression facades. It is not really interested in any of them. And it's an incredibly blunt book. And those things combine to make a book that's harmful. I really, I really, again, I started this being like, all right, this book is not for me. Because you know what? Like, I am a straight, somewhat white male, right? It's not for me. I understand that. I'm not going to like it. I like books with nuance. Also, I don't like just the author telling me stuff. And so, like, when I finished it, I gave it a little bit of a pass. I was like, okay, whatever. This is some some women want to rage at the machine. That's fine. That's good. I think wish fulfillment is very valid. And I have a bunch that I indulge in. But over the past week and a half, I've just realized how harmful what the book actually does is. The problem with these types of books is that when you are trying to get a message across, if you don't fully do your research and represent that purpose in the most realistic manner, then you lose the power of your statement. And this is definitely a book with a goal. Uh, or a social purpose in mind because of how blatantly it's stated. And you are teaching the wrong things, unfortunately, 
about human nature, which makes it harder for other people to accept and help heal others who have the wrong, pers- uh, well, that sounds very uh, uh, holier than thou of me, but it, it makes it harder for people to see the perspectives of those who are indoctrinated and to empathize with them and therefore actually do the helpful thing and rehabilitate them. And this book features people being tortured and murdered and it being framed as a good thing. Go ahead. Please. And so it just, like I said, it's just a complete lack of nuance. Lee Shamin comes in valuing women. None of the male characters that are good have... Now, maybe Yi because it's mentioned initially that he's like, what's wrong with the system? But he passively grows as a character. We don't actually see him come to terms with any of this, have that growth. There's no character that starts out perceptive. And again, the reason Lee Shamin is perceived as bad in the beginning is because he murdered his family and he's a murderer but again that has nothing to do with the core of like this patriarchal women versus men women like being subjugated society story nobody starts in this patriarchal position and then has a moment where they like see something and she sees that change is possible and that drives her like it's not that there's three characters she could have had a variety of views between the three of them yeah you know what i mean like she could have started in one place le chemin could have started in one place pretty boy could have started in another place and, then they and you could have seen all of them grow in different ways you yeah. can have a plurality of experiences that way yeah and wish fulfillment right that i think we've all sort of agreed that this story is a little bit of wish fulfillment and you you know what i feel that deadly education is a little bit wish fulfillment but in a better way than this one is. that's the other thing is i don't think this is actually very good wish fulfillment in terms of like good in quality because it's a bit like playing a bit like i used to oh, play no, yeah, exactly. with cheat codes right so like you can make yourself all powerful give yourself a bunch yeah of money, exactly exactly it's fun for like 10 or 15 minutes and then you're like this is too easy it's like the game sort of rots in your head it's like this is too easy that's the problem with this. It's not great witch fulfillment because it's too easy and it's too simple. So I want to make another comparison to another book we read that was, and in reviews that I read and people responding to it, people looked at it as a feminist book and it was Priory of the Orange Tree, but the book didn't ever say, we are treating women well. There's a couple moments where there's other societies that like women aren't treated as well in, and but they're like really small tiny moments you're just presented this society and like you can have a feminist character doing feminist things without reminding us every single page that she's fighting the thing she's doing the thing she's fighting like i i think this book would have been made better if it had been from third person well everyone um good luck if you read this book. Oh no, the majority of people love this. This book has a- Gosh darn it, that means we're not gonna, this is gonna be frowned upon this entire thing. Oh no, that's why I started in the beginning. Like people are gonna find this. We're gonna get destroyed on- Twitter. Okay, but the thing is you can tell in Goodreads, the Goodreads one book star reviews are super like comprehensive and they have specific details and they're well written. And the five star reviews are like, I don't know how grammar works. Let me just type words out. No, no, stop. You're making this worse. I think we're actually done. Do you have, did you have anything you wanted to go over uh no i think that was it i i would i think i would have liked it better if the last third had been different and it had been in third person i really liked the idea the execution was horrendous writing style has such an influence on me that i did not like the writing style not first person but i mean the quick pace and non-explicative nature of nuance and so on i thought it it over explained we got oh god so much so much tell instead of show it is on my feelings a like approximate five out of ten oh two i'd give it i'd give it a five out of ten Maybe, maybe a 4.5. I don't know. I didn't, I, as much as I've been like the neutral one here, I didn't love this book. It wasn't for me. Not for me, guys. Anyway, we will see you all next week when we will be post, we'll be doing another book. All three of you. All right. Catch you later. Bye-bye. Bye.